Oh, I mean, religious school here in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and he's a Jewish ritual and educational specialist. And so he's a kind of a New Testament scholar. We've talked about a lot of things. Uh, and, uh, and we share um, a great conversation and, and great thought. And so I want to bring Jeff on. And one of the things that we've been talking about is our times and season. And we've been looking at, at the festivals. And so if you remember, we talked about Rosh Hashanah. We talked about um, um, Yom Kippur. We talked about those days. And I spent some time uh, in the synagogue. As a matter of fact, some of our, our congregants went over to the synagogue to, uh, for, for Rosh Hashanah. The ladies that joined us, we thank you for doing that. But today we're going to um, partake of this Kingdom Diversity Series, and you're going to see me do this quite often. We're going to begin to share with other teachers that can share some things that are, show some connectivity to our faith, okay? And so, so Jeff's going to come, and he's going to talk about Hanukkah today. And it's that season, I think, between Christmas and New Year's, is that correct? That's when the days run, and uh, he said something to me in our discussion uh, that it celebrates that time when the oil didn't run out. When God miraculously sustained the oil. Yes, and so Jeff's going to come teach us. Now, now, and let me be clear and distinct. Jeff is Jewish. He's not a Christian. But we understand that our root comes from our father of faith, Abraham. So don't expect him to stand up here and lead you to salvation. That's not going to happen. Okay? He's going to teach you from the Jewish perspective and the Jewish root. Amen? Amen. But we have to understand where we came from and, what, and understanding uh, the connectivity between the two. And so uh, Jeff is going to come now, and uh, I'm going to get out of his way. It's 821, Jeff. I told you I'd have you by 820. So let's, let's do it, Jeff. Let's welcome Jeff McKinney. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Good morning. Uh, first, I just want to thank you, Keith, uh, for having the opportunity to be here. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the Jewish and Christian communities to make a, uh, a nice connection. Um, and clarify, I, know, I don't know if a lot of people have a, a lot of experience with Jewish people. McKinney's not really a Jewish last name. It's because my father's not Jewish, but my mother is. So according to Jewish law, I'm considered a full Jew. But um, anyways, um, oh, okay. Um, reason why I'm here, just to talk about Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah is... Uh, interesting holiday. And what I want to share with you is not only the history of Hanukkah, uh, also the legends that surround this story, uh, the rituals associated with Hanukkah and how we observe the holiday, and finally what the meaning of Hanukkah is, at least something that I've seen in, uh, in my understanding of it. But first I want to tell you what Hanukkah is not. Hanukkah is not a Jewish Christmas. It's, uh, a lot of people, I think, misunderstand that because it falls in line around the same time every year. Unlike many ho Jewish holidays, uh, Hanukkah, is also known as the Festival of Lights, uh, is not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, the historical events upon which the celebration is based are recorded in a book called Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2. Uh, there are two books contained within a later collection of writings known as the Apocrypha. Although Hanukkah is considered a minor Jewish festival, Today, it ranks, along with Passover and Purim, as a, one of the most beloved Jewish family holidays. So here's a brief history. Uh, I, funny thing, I called Keith last night because I was really working on this all week, and I, uh, I called him. I said, Keith, I've got like six pages because the story of Hanukkah is really long. And, um, and so he said, look, just keep it simple because I'm sure a lot of everyone in here has never experienced anything having to do with Hanukkah. So I've kind of scaled it down for you. So... Uh, in the year 168 BCE, that's before the Common Era, the Syrian tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes, and Epiphanes is a word that actually means God manifest. He, he called himself God manifest. Uh, he sent his soldiers to Jerusalem. Now the Syrians desecrated the temple, the holiest place for Jews at that time. Antiochus also abolished Judaism. He outlawed the observance of Shabbat, which is the Sabbath, which we still observe to this day on, on Saturday, and the festivals as well as circumcision. Altars and idols were set up for the worship of Greek gods, and he offered Jews two options, conversion or death. On the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev, which is the month that we're in now, uh, it's in 168 BC, the temple was renamed for the Greek god Zeus. A resistant movement led by a priestly family known as the Hasmoneans, or Maccabees, developed against the cruelty of Antiochus. The head of the family was Matiahu. He was an elderly, older man. He was a priest. 
Uh, before his death, Matiahu called his sons together and urged them to continue to fight in defense of God's Torah. And the Torah is the, the law, I guess, in the uh, Christian Old Testament, you call it the, it's the first five books in the Old Testament, right? Um, he asked them to follow the counsel of their brother, Shimon the Wise. In waging warfare, he said, their leader should be Judah the Strong. Judah was called Maccabee. Um, Maccabee is a word that's composed of the initials of the first four, word, uh, four, four letters of the Hebrew words, Mikomoka Ba'elim Adonai, which basically means, who is like you, O God? That was where the word Maccabee comes from. If you took uh, that phrase, Mikomoka Ba'elim Adonai, it's a mem, which is the first letter, kof, uh, bet, and then um, a he. Right, no, I'm sorry, a yod. You have Maccabee. And so it's like a, a, an abbreviation. Judah became the chief strategist and military leader of the resistance, and though outnumbered, Judah Maccabee and his fighters miraculously won two major battles, routing the Syrians uh, decisively. Although historians debate the causes and outcomes of the war in which Judah Maccabee and his followers defeated the Syrian armies of Antiochus, there is no doubt that Hanukkah evokes stirring images of Jewish valor against overwhelming odds. Other themes rooted in the observance of the holiday include the refusal to submit to the religious demands of, the, of an empire practicing idolatry, uh, the struggle against total assimilation into Hellenistic culture, and loss of Jewish identity, and the fight for Jewish political autonomy and self-determination. Hanukkah, which means dedication, is the festival that commemorates the purification and rededication of the temple following the defilement of the, of the Greeks, caused by the Greeks, during their occupation of that holy place. Today, the holiday reminds Jews to rededicate themselves to stand against forces that would destroy Judaism and to keep alive the flame of Jewish religion, culture, and peoplehood so that it may be passed on to the next generation. Originally, the eight-day holiday was intended to parallel the eight-day festival of Sukkot. Um, I don't know if yeah, you talked about Sukkot. Uh, that's the uh, festival we do around the fall. It's... Uh, we have sukkahs that we build. We, we have a Arun Minim, Lulav, and uh, Etrog. Um, it's a, a fall harvest festival. But because of the occupation of the Greeks, we weren't able to keep Sukkot. So they decided once we were able to cleanse the temple, we wanted to go back and at least keep it. So technically, Hanukkah is a late Sukkot, but it actually became its own holiday after that. Um, the books of Maccabees made no mention of the legend concerning a small jar of oil that unexpectedly lasted for eight days. Only centuries after the Maccabees defeat of the Syrians did the story of the jar of oil, which has, become, has come to be part of Hanukkah, uh, it appeared in the Talmud. Now, if you're not aware what it is, the Talmud is a collection of debates and discussions in which classical rabbis engaged uh, over centuries, actually. It takes a long time. Uh, the topics include halakha, which is Jewish law, uh, ethics, values, traditions, etc. There are two major sections that make up the Talmud. One is the Mishnah, or the Oral Law. Uh, this is uh, considered a companion to the Torah. If we have a commandment in the Torah that tells us you should do this, then the question is, well, how do you do it? You know, when we are commanded by the Torah to wear tefillin, which is a box that we have, well, the question is, what's tefillin? The Talmud tells you. If you were to put a mezuzah on your door, what's a mezuzah? The Talmud tells you. So these things are not uh, codified, they're not really explained in the Torah. How do you keep Shabbat? How do you kosher kill an animal? How do you, uh, you know, observe these different holidays? The Talmud tells us how to do that. Um, and of course, that's the companion to the Torah, which is, again, the first five books of the, of the Christian Old Testament. But of course, our translation is different. In that, it, uh, it also expounds the entailments of the Torah. So it gives a lot of detail on little things that sometimes when we read, we're kind of like, what does that mean? The Gemara is the second major section of the Talmud, and this consists of recorded commentary on the Mishnah. So you have all these rabbis debating, and then you've got commentary to go back to tell you what they were talking about, because sometimes you can't understand. <laughs> so the word Talmud itself is derived from the Hebrew verb to teach, which is lamud. It's uh, anytime you teach somebody, uh, it, it's a, uh, this word is, Talmud is actually derived from that. It can also be expressed as the verb to learn. So you can learn and teach at the same time. According to the legend, when the Maccabees entered the temple and began to reclaim it from the Greeks, they immediately relit the near Tammet. Uh, that's the eternal light, which burned constantly in the temple and has a parallel in our synagogues today. 
If you were to come to uh, Temple Beth Or to uh, go to Thizrael, uh, you walk in and right above, we have an ark where we have the Torah scroll, and right above that ark is this light. That light stays on <coughs> constantly. It's called the Ner Tamid. And tamid and Ner Tamid, Ner means eternal, Tamid means, or I'm sorry, Ner means light, Tamid is eternal. And so you have this eternal light to remind us of the presence of God wow. always within the midst of the people of Israel. Um, in the temple, they found a single jar of oil, which was sufficient for only one day. The messenger who was sent to secure additional oil took eight days to complete his mission. And miraculously, the single jar of oil continued to burn until his return. The rabbis of the Talmud attributed the eight days of Hanukkah to the miracle of the single jar of oil. Hanukkah stresses the miracle story, but not the military victory. Because when sovereignty was lost, early rabbis decided to, spread, to stress the spiritual over the temporal, which was, it was more important. And I also have my own theory. Um, I, I think also um, the, the, the Maccabees were the Hasmoneans, and that later became the group known as the Sadducees. Uh, the rabbis of the Talmud were Pharisees. And so I think because they didn't want to really attribute uh, this great military victory to the Sadducees, well, let's make this story about the oil, and that way we can kind of take away a little bit. We understand that, yes, they did a great thing, but eventually they, become a corrupt, they became a corrupt priesthood, and they really did, which is unfortunate. Um, but I think that might be the reason that that was also elevated as the major uh, holiday um, observance was about the oil. So although the practice of lighting the Hanukkah, which... Hanukkah is actually what we would call uh, this thing over here, we normally call it a menorah. Um, uh, the, the reason we call it a Hanukkah is because a menorah was actually what was in the temple. And the menorah only had seven branches, like this. So to differentiate it from the menorah in the temple, we call it a Hanukkah. Some people will call it a Hanukkah menorah. Both are fine, but traditionally it's called a Hanukkah. Uh, so the practice of lighting the Hanukkah was common throughout much of the 19th century. Uh, North American Jews, though, tended to neglect most of the other traditions and practices associated with the holiday. By the 1920s, however, Jews increasingly added gift-giving to their Hanukkah celebrations, which prompted Christians to refer to Hanukkah as the Jewish Christmas. Like many aspects of Jewish religious practice, the transformation of Hanukkah was linked to the growth of North American Jewry within its unique environment. The elevation of Hanukkah to a major holiday was a result of Jews acculturating themselves to a North America that was overwhelming, overwhelmingly Christian in population and in symbols. So although Hanukkah had become an important holiday uh, by the 1920s and then by North American Jews, uh, it would be incorrect to record it as an imitation of Christmas with an emphasis on exchange of presents. Rather, North American Jews use this holiday as a celebration of family, reinforcing Jewish identity in a population, in a place whose population may be overwhelmingly Christian, but in which Jews feel very much at home. Hanukkah, therefore, is a means for North American Jews to feel a kinship with their neighbors while simultaneously asserting their Jewish distinctiveness. So is there a Christian connection to Hanukkah? And I, I told Keith I would I'd talk about this. I, I, um, I've spent a lot of time, I, I do read a lot of the New Testament, um, because it's, there is some great historical data for it for Jews as well, um, but also it's, we, are, we do have different theologies, so a lot of times it's, it's, it is for my own people for us to have a defense or to have answers when we're questioned uh, in some ways, and we won't get into that. Um, but <laughs> Hanukkah can be found in the book of John 10, verse 22 through 39. Uh, it's called the Feast of Dedication. I believe, if I remember correctly, um, it says that uh, Jesus was walking in the porticos of Solomon during the Feast of Dedication, if I remember that's, that's what it was saying. So the Feast of Dedication, which you'll find in John 10, 22, that's another name for Hanukkah. Now, did Jesus celebrate Hanukkah with lighting a menorah? Maybe, maybe not. It's possible uh, due to the fact that there were two Pharisaic houses during the Second Temple period, uh, Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, uh, and they had differing opinions on how to light the Hanukkah menorah. So obviously if they had differing opinions, they must have been doing the lighting of the menorah then. Um, of course, Beit Shammai says you start with eight candles and then you diminish uh, to let you know how many days are left. Beit Hillel says you start with one and you count up so that we know which day it is, and also to increase the sanctity day by day. And of course, Hillel and Shammai were before Jesus was born, so you know, we, uh, it's uh, very possible that it wasn't a very widespread 
Testament at that time, but we do know it existed. Um, but again, like I said, it's possible that he may or may not have. And by the way, we do follow the ruling of Beit Hillel. That's basically what Judaism follows today is uh, Beit Hillel against Beit Shammai. Now, um, I'm kind of to show you Hanukkah Decoration 101 is, that's it. That's how we, that's how we sell it. Um, there's no schlepping a tree or, you know, you might put some, from some uh, lights up, but that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell, is that. Very simple. Um, <laughs> in my house, we get all of them out because uh, it, it, you, traditionally, everyone in the household is supposed to light their own Hanukkah. And so uh, at the end of the, the holiday, on the eighth day, we actually get all of them. I've got like 12 of them that we get out on one table and it gets hot, but it's, it's very beautiful. You turn all the lights off and, and you have all eight candles burning. It's a, a wonderful experience. So the, how do we celebrate it? Well, first, we, when we put the Hanukkah out, we'll put it by a window or maybe outside. We want to publicize the miracle. We want people to know uh, about it. Um, it, there's different customs. I know uh, within the uh, ultra-Orthodox, uh, I was affiliated with them for a long time, uh, the custom is to put it in your doorway opposite the mezuzah. So you have your mezuzah on your right-hand side, you'd have the Hanukkah on the left-hand side. Um, the candles that we use, and you can use actually jars of oil, they have little cups that have oil in them with the wicks, you can use those or you can use uh, Hanukkah candles. Uh, those are only to be used for the holiday. You, you can't use them for illumination to light your house. You can't use them for warmth uh, because they are set apart. They're holy. In a sense, they're for the holiday. So you're not actually allowed to get common use out of them. Um, if you have to have a light to read by, um, and if you, know, if you were, I guess, back in before electricity, you would have to have some other source of light to read by. But you can't use it... Uh, you know, to sit by the Hanukkah and read or something like that. But we do have a light that you can use, and that's what this one right here is called the Shamish. This is actually the lights of the menorah, the, the Hanukkah. These are the ones that count for the days. This one on the top is basically just the candle that you use to light the rest of them. So it really technically doesn't even count. There's a lot of Hanukkahs that you'll find where they'll have all these and then the what we call the Shamish, which is uh, shamash can be uh, translated as servant candle, if you will. Uh, you'll have it off to the side or something like that because it's actually not part of this. It's kind of separate. So the candles at least have to burn, or the lights have to burn for at least half an hour. Um, you, you, anything less than that, you technically haven't fulfilled the mitzvah, or, which is the commandment. Um, and like I said, each family member should light for him or herself. And if that's not feasible, then the head of the household lights for the entire family. In the Talmud, it tells us the light at sunset, the reason why we want to better publicize the, the miracle of Hanukkah, uh, to let everybody know. And, of course, there is a dispute with, within Judaism. That's not surprising. Um, <laughs> the dispute is, do you bless first, bless God for the, for the miracle, and then light, or then do you light and then bless? It's not resolved. So either way you go, it's okay. Now, we're told that lighting... The Hanukkah is a mitzvah, a commandment. But yet I told you that Hanukkah is not in the Torah. So how is this a commandment? How is it a, it's a mitzvah? And we get that from Deuteronomy 17.11, which says, According to the law which they shall teach you, you shall do. So when uh, Moses was told by God to set up a what we call a Sanhedrin, uh, 70 elders, they are the ones who expounded on the Torah and told us this is how we keep the commandments. So whatever they decide... That's what we're supposed to do. When we place the candles in, uh, they go from right to left. So you would actually start off like this. I'll just go halfway. So you'd go like that. But when you light them, and you have your servant candle, right, your shamash, you light them from left to right. You, go, you start with the, the day that it is, and then you light back. Because these have already been done, so you would actually light whatever day it is. That's the first one you light. But you always start from the right, work your way to the left, and then light from, light, uh, from left to right. Um, on Shabbat, which is the Jewish Sabbath, you light the Hanukkah candles before the Shabbat candles. Um, the understanding is that in Judaism, uh, we sanctify the Sabbath by having candles at the beginning of the day and at the end. 
So the Sabbath candles are the ones that are like the marker. They're the barrier. This is after this date, you can't light any you know, fire until after, Hanuk- or after Shabbat is done. So you light your uh, Hanukkah before Shabbat, but at Havdalah, which is the end of Shabbat, and Havdalah is a Jewish word that means separation, uh, you, there's two different rules. <laughs> uh, you actually can light the Hanukkah candles first if you're in the synagogue, or if you're at home, you light the Havdalah candle first, and then you light your Hanukkah menorah. It's a lot of rules. I mean, this is, I don't know why we do this, but we do, but we love it. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> actually, you know, and I know it sounds difficult, but it's very, very easy because it becomes a part of you. If you do it enough, it becomes something that's a second nature and you don't even think about. Um, now, these two things, this is another part of Hanukkah. Uh, and this is something that developed a lot later. And there's a lot of stories that surround it. This is the dreidel. Uh, this is a game that... Children play around Hanukkah, uh, you, you spin the dreidel and wherever it lands, you're either going to put money into the little pot or you'll take some or you'll maybe give half. Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing about it is, there's a, the one story that I was always told was that uh, during the time of the Roman occupation, uh, Torah law, Torah study was, was illegal. You weren't allowed to study Torah, of course, upon pain of death. And so the rabbis would gather the children together and they came up with this little game because Rome had no problem with gambling. So as they, were, they would teach Torah, and then all of a sudden, uh, Roman soldiers would come up, they would break this out, and all they would look like they're just playing a, a little gambling game. And so, um, you know, the soldiers would leave them alone, and then they, okay, let's go back to studying some Torah. The interesting thing about the, uh, and I don't know if, I, if that's correct, but it's still a fanciful story. Um, but there are two different types of dreidels, believe it or not. One is if you're outside the land of Israel, um, you have uh, this one right here, and it would, the little Hebrew letters, you have a nun, uh, you have a gimel, a he, and a shin. A shin. Uh, it stands for Neskadol Hayasham, which means a great miracle happened there. But if you're in the land of Israel, you have a different dreidel. You have uh, nun, gimel, he, and then pe, which is totally different. And that means Neskadol Haya. Po, which means a great miracle happened here. So, <laughs> so it's, um, they're, they're, they're very unique. And believe it or not, you can actually find the, what we call diaspora dreidels in Israel. And I actually got these Israeli dreidels um, over here at the, uh, what is this, the um, world market. So I don't know. It was interesting. Um, some of the foods that we eat on Hanukkah, we have latkes. Uh, those are potato pancakes, uh, sufganiyot, which uh, every community does sufganiyot. Sufganiyot basically are jelly donuts. It's not a very healthy holiday, <laughs> um, but it's mostly about the oil is what it is. Uh, anything fried, basically. You know, you can, um, my wife likes to get healthy sometimes and we'll, we'll fry some, uh, some vegetables or something, but that's not as fun. But, um, but, <laughs> but basically the, the whole purpose is, is oil. Um, and if you have a heart condition, I always say use coconut oil or olive oil. But, you know, some people like to use the other kind of oil. I'm like, ah, that's okay. Um, there are different Jewish customs around the world. Uh, Syrian Jews or Spanish Jews in Syria light an extra candle of thanks each night. So if they, they have four, you know, they'll light an extra one and they'll actually have uh, for the whole season um, because they were finally accepted by the native Syrian Jews. Uh, in Syria, the native Syrian Jews. Um, the Syrian Jews also observe a day of complete silence on the day after Hanukkah to repent of slanderous talk, probably about the Spanish Jews. So <laughs> that might be why. <laughs> it's just interesting. Uh, Syrian Jewish children would go around their community collecting money. Uh, on the last night of Hanukkah, the children arranged for three feasts, uh, one for their teachers, their rabbis, one for the poor in their community, and one for themselves. And then, of course, the rabbis and the lay leaders in the community would all participate in all three of those. Uh, the Sephardic Jews, which um, Sephardic and Ashkenaz, these are two di- different types. My, um, my mother's side is actually a mix. I'm actually Sephardic through my mother's mother, but I'm Ashkenaz through my mother's grandfather. It's, it's different, but Ashkenaz Jews are basically Jews from Eastern Europe. Sephardic Jews are Jews from Spain, Portugal, and the Middle East. And the Sephardic Jews of Turkey 
have a what's called a merenda, which is a potluck uh, dinner or, uh, or picnic on the last day of Hanukkah. And in Turkey, the Sabbath of Hanukkah was called Shabbat Halbasha, uh, the, Shabbat, the Shabbat of clothing the poor. Um, the rabbi's remarks during that Shabbat would direct people to provide clothing for the poor, which were dis, uh, distributed at the end of Hanukkah. So, and I guess that's, yeah, that's about it on that. So what, what is the meaning of Hanukkah? And I was telling Keith that um, Hanukkah has got a lot of different meanings, obviously, and it's, it's actually a very beautiful holiday. But I think the major meaning of it has to go back to, uh, in Judaism, we have a concept called tikkun olam. Uh, tikkun olam means to rectify or repair the world. Uh, it's something that we do through our thoughts, our speech, our deeds, is how we treat one another, is how we're supposed to be caretakers of the earth. Uh, when uh, God created man, he said, you know, he, he uh, made them caretakers of the earth. So part of that is we are to rectify the uh, this fallen nature, this, this world is how it is. We want to make it a better place. Um, and it's interesting that Hanukkah falls uh, for us during winter. Winter is cold. It gets dark early. It's depressing. Depression actually is one of the highest uh, things during this time, suicide as well. So it's, it's a very uh, a dark time. And the neat thing is that Hanukkah and Christmas, you know, basically they focus their celebrations around light. And light pushes away the darkness. It brings warmth. It brings um, uh, uh, closeness. And it, and it helps us to, to see in the dark. So... In Judaism, there, there's an understanding that everyone, everybody in this room has a spark of God within them. Everyone in the whole world. Um, when God created man in the Garden of Eden, it says he breathed his life, he breathed life into man. Uh, that was a divine soul that was put into man. It was a spark of God. And so what we should be, in essence, is the shamash. We should be this, this candle. If I just lit this candle, we turn all the lights off. It's not real bright. It gives a little bit of light, but the darkness is still really there. But if I take that candle and I light the other candles, I increase the brightness. I make it, I make it a lot lighter, and I chase away the darkness. And if we were in here colding and we got a bunch of candles in here, it would get pretty warm, it'd be, you know, pretty hot. But that's the purpose of it, is that we are to be like the servant candle. We are to be a light uh, and to take the knowledge of God to treat our fellow man with love, with, with justice, uh, with, with care, and we're to go out and do that. And I think that's the main message of Hanukkah, is that if, if I light a, a candle in you, if I help your neshama, as we call it, to grow, and then you go out and you affect others, and before you know it, the whole world is, is shining. Right? And that's how we should be. So we have, to, you know, we, have a, we have to light up the darkness. We have to be the shamash. Um, there's a famous saying by one of my favorite Jewish rappers <laughs> is, is you, you take the darkness of this world and you make it light. Um, it, even though we have very dark situations, there, are, there is good somewhere. And it's our opportunity, our job, to find the good, yes. to elevate it, yes. to right. transform that darkness into light. Right. Because then we can offer it back to God. And then we can say, look, I've taken something that was dark and I made it good. Right. And that's the purpose of Hanukkah in that sense. So... <laughs> Um, but that, that, that was on my heart I want to share with you guys. And I think it's, this is off, you know, the, coming here and speaking with you guys is part of that as well. Because, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, you may, we may have the, different theological beliefs, but honestly, we're all human beings. We all love God. We all should love each other. And we have this opportunity, especially at this time of the, of, of the year, to just draw close. And so um, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. It was very much a joy and an honor. Um, and I do want to. Um, I want to invite everybody here. We're having what's called a Hanukkah hoopla at a Good at Israel. Uh, it's at eleven o'clock, and um, we'll have food, we'll have gifts, we'll have all kinds of stuff. But just everyone in here is welcome to come. Uh, it's over in Old Cloverdale. I don't know the address, but a GPS at Good at Israel, or um, Heath, I'll just give you the address. And maybe you can give it out, and that way. Um, Everyone here, you can just come in and, uh, you know, if you've never been to a synagogue, perfect time to come, check it out. Um, you know, the rabbis will be, well, Rabbi Kramer will be there. Uh, he can probably show you around and everything, but uh, you know, our children have all put up some holiday items, 
and, um, and some pictures and such. So it's a big community-wide event. It's open to everybody, but I wanted to personally invite everyone here to Hanukkah Hoopla. So I hope to see you there. So, all right. Thank you. Let's give you a big hug. Keep your mic on. I want to I want to entertain any quick questions you may have. I know this is different for a Sunday morning, um, but I want you to understand. And as you can see, as Jeff concluded with us spreading that light, it is there is a connection that we want to to be that light in this time of darkness. And um, and Jeff and I have been sharing, and uh, he's a great great man, and I, I appreciate him coming to share. So let's give another round of applause to Jeff. Um, does anyone have any questions right off? Because there's a couple of things I want to point out from your discussion that we can, if you could share with us a little bit more on that. Um, um, you mentioned um, oh, the one, one, a couple of things in the, in the, in your talk. You, you talked about the Torah. So, mm -hmm. um, Torah for you, meaning for the Jews. Uh, Torah can be a multitude of different things. It can be the first five books: uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, it could also be the whole, what you call the Old Testament. It can be the whole uh, Old Testament plus the Talmud. Um, it, this right here, teaching, is a Torah as well. So, because Torah basically means instruction. So anytime you give an instruction, it's a Torah. But the Torah itself is the first five books. Uh, and then, of course, anything from that, uh, we still consider Torah. But and the Greek, the Greek um, comparison to that is what we call the Pentateuch. Or the Septuagint, I think. Oh, the Septuagint, yeah. okay. Right, right. All right, right. okay, good, good, good. Um, there was another point. Oh, I want you to, I want you to share on this. When, we, when I was teaching earlier, I taught about uh, Noah mm -hmm. and the Great Flood. And uh, you gave me some instruction on the name of Noah. Yeah, Noah. That's the syllabication of it. Yeah, Noah is an interesting name because, um, and I heard this from a rabbi years ago, um, Noah means uh, rest. He will give us rest from our labors. Um, and it's made of the, the Hebrew word, uh, the letters nun and he, uh, nun and, no, no, wait, nun and he. If you take those and reverse them, you get chen. Uh, chen is uh, chet nun, which means grace. It means, uh, you know, it's a... If, you know, it's just the flipping of the word. So it's pretty interesting that, um, you know, in, uh, in Noah, God's grace was that he provided a way out for the people. So uh, that was, uh, it's an interesting little, little known teaching on, on Noah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and as you shared that, when we talked about it in the synagogue, I came back and, and uh, we were doing a series on, um, on Noah. We talked mm -hmm. about the great flood, and I pointed that out about his name and, and Noah's uh, questioning in Genesis of, you know, have I found grace? If I found right. grace in your sight, right. and yet his very name meant grace. Right, right. Yeah. Flip, but yes. Flip, it right. means, it yeah. means grace. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But uh, again, uh, thank you. Any questions or comments or thoughts? Uh, come on. Okay, Jim, uh, real quick, are yeah. there any different meaning uh, with the different colors on the candles? No. Um, honestly, you can use uh, white candles, different multicolor. It's kind of whatever the manufacturer puts out. Um, but the, yeah, the candles, the uh, colors don't really have a meaning. Um, before we did candles, you know, like I so said, we used to have uh, little cups with oil that you would put in there. So the candles is kind of more of a modern uh, invention. It's just easier, I think, but yeah. Okay, last question. Okay. Um, I heard you mention earlier something about um, about doing this as a dedication as the miracle. Mm -hmm. I heard you talk about the miracle. Is the miracle more, uh, something that's um, going for setting the next year in order, or just um, so in this year? Oh, the, the dedication was for the temple back then, for the second temple, um, which we call Herod's Temple, you know. Um, and that's what we commemorate. Uh, the, um, the oil was something that, that, even though it's not specified in the Book of Maccabees, um, we do know that just a little while later that had popped up as a story that it happened. So it's possible that it did and that it was more of an oral tradition that was handed down and then finally wrote down and when the Talmud was codified, which was close to 400 years later. Uh, and that's just how things are in Judaism. We, we would orally hand things down before they were finally written down after the fall of the temple uh, when we were facing a, an existential crisis because as a Jewish people, we didn't have the temple. We, you know, we were scattered out. And so in order to kind of um, uh, save uh, everything, all of our knowledge, we came up with the Gemara, the Mishnah, the, the Talmud, basically. 
so that everything is all written down. But normally that was always orally handed down the whole time. So the miracle of the oil showing up in the town, it could just be that a uh, story was handed down, but it was never recorded in Maccabees, but it was written down in Talmud. So, I, you know, I like to think that it did happen. I think it's, a, it's a, a beautiful story. But people really debate if it did or not, and that's okay. And that's, that's how we are. Jews, if you, it's this old funny uh, saying that if you get uh, three Jews together, you get five different opinions. And that's how we are. And so we debate. We, you know, just like Moses did, we'll argue with God. I mean, when we're instructed to argue with God, We'll argue our own text. We'll we'll sit there and tear it apart. Um, but that's how we are, and that's what we're supposed to do. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Come on. I'm sorry. Somebody grab a mic. Grab a mic. This, this one. Hello, and thank Thanks. you. I just want to uh, more information. It's called the Mazuzu. Is where you put on the doorpost? Right. Yeah, the mezuzah is, there's a commandment in the Torah that says that you will write these words upon the doorpost of your house and, and on the gates. And so the main question is what words? Well, obviously it's, the, you know, what the rabbis came up with is the words that refer to that commandment because um, you can't put the whole Torah on your door. So you write, you put these words. But what they do is, the mezuzah itself is actually a small scroll, and it varies in size from that big to that big when it's rolled up. Um, it's handwritten, and on the outside of it, when you roll it up, it has the name Shaddai on the outside. So it's got the holy name of God on it. Um, we have a case called a mezuzah case, and that's what we put it in to protect it. And then we put that on our doorposts. So that when we go in and we go out, we see... Uh, God's name, God's, you know, the, the uh, basically the Torah right there. Uh, tradition is, is when you pass by, you kiss the mezuzah. Um, you, you're, this is a way to pay uh, honor and respect to the Torah as you go in and as you go out because you're commanded to speak about the words as you go on your way, walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. So it's, these are constant reminders that we have. So that's what that is. Um, go ahead. You got one more? Yeah, it's constant. Um, you know, we have mezuzahs at the front and back door of our house and in our um, all the rooms except the bathroom. You don't put a mezuzah on your bathroom door because obviously it's not a place you want to put a Torah. Um, but everywhere else you would put the mezuzah up. And um, tradition is that when you, if you sell your house, if the incoming family is Jewish, you keep your mezuzahs up for them. And, but if they're not, then you take the mezuzahs down, and then you take them with you to your next home, and then you put them back up. But they're constant. They're fixed permanently to the door. So, yeah. All right. Um, it's interesting, and I'm on. Okay, come on. I'm sorry. What? Do you mean to put that? Do you mean to put that? Do you mean to put that? Yeah, we want you to have a mic so you can hear me. Yeah, we, we want to hear you. Well. Come on, it's okay. Um, question. Yeah. In the study of when God gave Moses the law in the uh, tabernacle, and he was uh, illustrating how they should build the menorah, mm -hmm. um, is there a significant or is there a difference? Why? I just want to know because it was like normally six, three branches. Right. And then it was a. Uh, one in the middle, why do you have eight? Right. Or the, is there a significant reason for the extra branch? Yeah, great question. Um, for Hanukkah, so that we don't build our own menorah, and also to celebrate the eight days of Hanukkah, we have a, uh, because the miracle revolves around the light uh, for the menorah in the temple. So there's a correlation that we draw. So we don't have, obviously, a seven branch menorah, because in the seven branch menorah, this actually is not elevated, it's actually down here, right. kind of right. equal. Uh, so we elevate this one so that it doesn't count. So technically it's not a menorah. Um, we also add these because each one represents the eight days. So it's not uh, like the menorah in the temple. This is actually completely different. That's why we call it a Hanukkah, so that it differentiates between the menorah and the temple. Um, also, the menorah in the temple was, was continually lit. It had to be continually lit day and night. This is only supposed to burn for half an hour uh, to commemorate the holiday. So it's, it, it is different. Um, and similar in some ways, and you know, it's easy to see how it could get mixed up. Uh, but the fact that it's actually uh, eight branches instead of seven, um, if you added the shamashan, you would actually have it nine, but we don't count this. 
So that's what the, that's why it, it looks the way it is. So it's specifically for Hanukkah, and that way we're not breaking the commandment of making a menorah out of wood or stone or anything else, because we're commanded that it's supposed to be only made out of a solid sheet of gold. So we can't, you know, that's why we don't have that. And now there are small menorahs that you can get that are made out of different um, things, like different metals, and people use that for maybe Shabbat, and that's fine. Um, but we wouldn't say this is the menorah that we're going to put in the temple. So there is a difference um, because of the height of it as well. I think has a lot to do with it. So there um, and the usage of it. It's not an eternally lit menorah. Or menorah so yeah. more more representation for the home. Right. This is something you would use in your house. Um, you might even use it in the synagogue as well. Um, and it's just for the celebration of the actual holiday itself. So part two. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is this? That star is or star. Of, what is that's the star of David. Um, okay. This wow. is um, the the story goes that on the end of Solomon's um, on Solomon's shield, and I think on the end of his scepter was the star, and this was the the sixth branch uh, star of the of the Jewish people. So this is kind of like our symbol, if you will. Um, I know Christians have a cross. Is it like a cross to the right. Christian? Right, right. right. So, so we have a star of David. Yeah, right. right. This is just our life. identification as a people. So like in uh, Nazi Germany, when you know they sent us off to the camps, we had to wear a yellow Jewish star. That was how we identified as Jews. And so in the same way, you know, this that's that's basically who we are as a people. And so that's what that is. But yeah. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Wow. Has this been informative to you? It's been awesome. It's been awesome. I'm going to get you out of here. Um, but man, we'll have you back to do some more sharing with us. And uh, we appreciate you coming and, uh, and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you greatly, man. All right. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff has a word. You don't have to teach today. You had somebody take your class? Well, for a little bit at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so Jeff's going to head out. Uh, if y'all can see him out, he's going to head out to go teach his class.